at, at the conclusion of, of our third book, uh, I, I said to my artist that I, I thought we, we really should have some sort of branding for the series. And this is what we came up with, the I Knew George Washington series. So our four books are the life of George Washington. Washington is seen through the eyes of historic figures that knew him very well. They actually all knew each other very well. Um, Matt and I had a conversation earlier, and um, so, you know, I, I kind of got real lucky as, as a self-published author. Barnes & Noble was going to do my first book, but they had too many demands, and there was I could see a little kind of political correctness seeping into uh, the conversation back and forth. And I'll, I'll give you real quick, for instance, the books are... Uh, originally set out to be for a younger audience. It turns out 90% of my audience are adults in like a quick and colorful snapshot on Washington. But our original intention was for younger readers. And uh, Barnes & Noble came back and said, we don't allow the use of the word tobacco in books for younger readers. I said, so what you're saying is that we describe the backbreaking work that that uh, that African slaves did in planting tobacco. You don't want people to know about that. Well, no, let's let's make it some other crop. Let's not make it tobacco. So then, and then they told me I had to use my own art. Uh, they, I had to use their artist. And I think you'll concur once you get a look at some of the artwork. That artwork is pretty good. I had a friend that was a watercolor artist. Went to him when I had the idea to hatch the first book. It would you be interested in doing art for a book? He said. I've never done it before, but let's let's give it a whirl. So, unfortunately, he's a graphic artist, so we were able to, once we decided to do it on our own, and my connection with Barnes & Noble actually talked me into doing it on my own. He said, look, you're, you're, not, the, uh, you're not the quiet, shy type. Uh, you live in the middle of the 13 colonies where these stories took place. You should be able to promote this on your own. He did get me an editor in New York who edited all four, all four of the books uh, for readership, and then, as I was about to say, as a self-published author, uh, and I had mentioned Matt in, in conversation at La Hall, I became very lucky when the research historian at Mount Vernon in Virginia, a woman by the name of Mary Thompson, uh, took an interest in, in the series and edited all four of the manuscripts for us. So we are, the, the stories are historic fiction, uh, but I make the claim based on the fact that Mount, Ver Mount Vernon did all the editing for me that we are 100% historically accurate, right? So we, we're showing you an image of, uh, of, of the, uh, this, the title for the series. And then in this presentation, uh, we're going to give you a quick run, run through of the entire series. So we'll show you the four, uh, the covers of all four of the books, and then uh, some of the uh, highlighted images and manuscripts uh, from those stories. As, as we walk through the process. So the, the, the first book was, uh, uh, I was inspired to do the first book. About the time that Barack Obama was running for president, there was a lot of talk about race. There's still a lot of talk about race. Um, and I thought, you know, there's a, a relationship that Washington had with an individual that he was very close to, and it happened to be a man that he owned. Um, his enslaved valet, Billy Lee. Billy Lee has a distinction of being the only slave that Washington mentions by name in his will, and he's the only slave to be given immediate freedom in Washington's will. So unwittingly, when I elected to have Billy tell the story, uh, I, I created a little bit of a template for future stories on Washington as seen through the eyes again of other individuals that knew him well. So that's how we ended up moving down the road with the series and uh, books two, three, and four after this one. What we do know is that Billy comes to Mount Vernon with his brother Frank in 1768. Uh, Billy goes immediately to work as George Washington's valet. Uh, Washington takes 10, 10 steps in one direction. Billy takes nine steps in that direction. They're together uh, every waking moment uh, of the day. Little did the two men know that uh, a few years up the road, there's going to be a revolutionary war. George Washington is going to be selected to be the commander in chief of the Continental mm -hmm. Army. And Billy, who's with him in Philadelphia for both the second, first and second Continental Congress, uh, is going to march off to war quite literally with George Washington. So when Washington writes his will in July of 1799, he writes that 
all the slaves that he owns in his own right upon the decease of my wife shall receive their freedom. So uh, as a little bit of an aside, what Washington doesn't realize is he's kind of handed Martha a T-shirt with a big target in the middle of the back because the slave population finds out that when she's dead, they're free. Right? That's going to do strange things to people, or the thought process anyway. Martha does move into the third floor of Mount Vernon, and it's often thought that she did that, did that for a security reason. But Washington goes on to write in his will, with the exception, and he refers to him as his mulatto servant, with the exception of my mulatto servant, William, due to his attachment to me and his service to me during the Revolutionary War, he's to be granted immediate freedom. So, uh, again, historic fiction allows us to uh, have Billy, create Billy uh, in later life, and we know that he outlives the Washingtons. Um, he begins the story... Uh, and we'll get to that origin, but he begins a story in, in the kitchen at Mount Vernon telling some of the younger folks on the plantation that didn't know Washington, his life with George Washington. From that point on, everything is historically accurate. And to the, to the extent that we know that Billy lived the rest of his days at Mount Vernon, he's a free man, he's free to go, but he never leaves Mount Vernon. He lives the rest of his life there. Oral tradition, not written down anywhere, but oral tradition at Mount Vernon is that he's He's buried in the slave burial ground also in Mount Vernon. So even though he's a free man, he still ends up likely in the slave burial ground. Our second story, uh, this, this book is in, uh, inspired by a document that's in our collection, which we'll eventually show you in this presentation as well. But th this art image depicts the night Washington passes away. It's December 14, 1799. Do we have a pointer there, Matt? Yes, we do. So the Washington bed suite, for anyone that's ever visited Mount Vernon, uh, you know that the Washington bed suite is right in this corner of, of, the, uh, of the building. So it's, uh, it's late on the 14th. Washington is about to pass away, and he's about to utter the final words of his long and fruitful life, tis well. So in the room when he passes is Martha, uh, Washington's long longtime secretary, a man by the name of Tobias Lair, who's sitting on the edge of the bed, quite literally holding his hand when he dies. And also standing on the other side of the bed is his longtime friend, Dr. James Craig. Craig, although not a household name, is the individual that tells the story. Craig, at the time that Washington pass, passes, has known Washington probably longer than anyone that's still alive. Matt and I were talking about the uh, beginning of the French and Indian War, essentially our first recorded world war, that begins here in Pennsylvania. When I began to research Dr. Craig, I didn't, I knew he was washing his bed, somebody passed, but I didn't realize at the Fort Necessity campaign, the first major battle of the French and Indian War here in Pennsylvania, Dr. Craig is George Washington's battlefield surgeon. So in 1754, they meet for the first time. There were the battlefields for all four years of Washington's involvement in the French and Indian War. Craig then serves as a battlefield surgeon for all eight years of the American Revolution on the continental side. And after the war and Washington's retirement from the presidency, Craig is living in Alexandria and he's a very frequent of a guest at Mount Vernon. He's also the physician for the Washington family, as well as the enslaved community of Mount Vernon. Our third story, a little bit of a, a better known figure is telling us about life with Washington, and that's the young French aristocrat who arrive, arrives here on the shores of North America in 1779, I'm sorry, 1777, to fight alongside George Washington, and that is the Marquis de Lafayette. So Washington never has any of his own children. Uh, ironically, it, when Lafayette is two years old, his father is killed in the French and Indian War, what's known in Europe as the Seven Years War. Uh, Lafayette loses his father when he's two years old, ironically, in the war that was begun by George Washington. And the two would eventually come together and have a uh, share kind of a father and son relationship. Lafayette comes back to the United States on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 1824 and 1825. So a lot of what we know about Lafayette comes from that visit. Had he never returned, I don't know that he would be quite as popular as he is now. 
But in, 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 in that time period, he's invited back here. He's the last living major general from the American Revolution. It's 50 years later, and he tours the country. Uh, so uh, he, again, cities, counties, uh, towns named after Lafayette, uh, college in Eastern Pennsylvania named after him, uh, pretty much are all coming from that 50-year return visit. But not only is uh, he very much devoted to George Washington, but he would play an enormous role in the Virginia campaign, which culminates in the Cornwallis surrender at Yorktown, which I believe the anniversary might be tomorrow. Our history educator in the back there, October 19th. We're close. Yeah. We're close to the anniversary. So Lafayette tells us about life with George Washington. Uh, and, and again, in this story, a little bit, a little bit more of a military story uh, than, the, than the other books as a, re, as a result of Lafayette's involvement in that war. Our fourth cover, and um, doing a fair amount of lecturing, uh, lots of requests to do a story from a female perspective. So I thought, and my fourth and probably final yeah, let's give that a try. So when we think of George Washington, who's the first female that you think of? Probably Martha, right? So took a look into that. Martha's a pretty interesting individual. But I found as I looked a little bit further uh, that Washington and Martha ended up raising, he not only raised Martha's two children, Martha actually gives birth to four children, two die in infancy. One dies at age 17, one dies at age 25 or 26. Washington raises both of them from childhood. But I looked into it a little bit uh, further down the road. Washington ends up, along with Martha, ends up raising two of her grandchildren. So at Yorktown, um, in camp arrives Martha's son, Jackie Park Custis. Against the better wishes of his wife and his mother, he would like to be in Yorktown for what appears to be the imminent surrender of Lord Cornwallis and his British forces, which could very easily uh, end the American Revolution. He's only there a short while, and he is stricken with a camp fever. About two weeks after the surrender, and you've got to think of the euphoria of, of the Cornwallis surrender, Jackie Custis dies and he sends the Washington family into deep mourning. Out of that deep mourning comes a, a new birth, a new relationship. Martha has seen in her daughter-in-law um, maybe some emotional weakness and some physical weakness after the birth, after her daughter-in-law gives birth to Martha's grandchildren, both three and four. So Martha makes her a deal. Uh, you remain at your plantation with the older two girls, which is just up the road from Alexandria. General Washington and I will raise the younger two children here at Mount Vernon, and her daughter-in-law agrees to that arrangement. Out of the two children, a girl and a boy, Eleanor, known as Nellie, Eleanor Nellie Park Custis tells our fourth story. So, quickly, Washington is disappointed by uh, Martha's son, Jackie. He never develops into what he thinks he should have developed into. And the youngest grandchild, George Washington Park Custis, never develops into what Washington had high expectations for both men. Nellie does. Uh, we, know, we know for a fact that Nellie does meet all of his expectations. So as I began to research Nellie, I found that when, when the government was in Philadelphia, when Washington was in Philadelphia as president, she becomes good friends with a woman, but a young girl her age, maybe 10, 12 years old, a girl by the name of Elizabeth Bordley. She and Elizabeth Bordley write letters to each other for a, nearly a 60 year period from roughly 1790 all the way into the early 1850s. They're writing back and forth each other when they're not together. So again, historic fiction allows me the latitude to create the beginning of the story. And essentially, the beginning of the story is Nellie kind of writing one last letter to Elizabeth Bordley, who has sent her a message and said, you know, we've both gotten older, we're up in age. Let's recount that, those great days that we spent together while you're, uh, 
while your step-grandfather was the first president of the United States. So Nellie, Nellie takes us down that path uh, in, in corresponding with her good friend Elizabeth and recalls those days. So uh, as Lafayette is more of a war story, um, Nellie becomes more of a presidential, eight years as president kind of centered story because she's an eyewitness to all that takes place there. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, historic fiction, all historically accurate. Uh, I use Washington's diaries and also the, his letter. So the, the, the presidential, let's call it Washington's presidential library, if you will, is at the Alderman Library at the University of Virginia, the papers of George Washington. 100 volumes uh, broken down into various series, the Colonial Series, the, Revolution, uh, the Revolutionary War Series, um, and, and so on, all the way up to retirement. What is left of his six diaries? So a lot of his original diaries were handed out as souvenirs, and unfortunately, we lost a lot of that information. But there are six volumes of his diaries, so we can place him in certain places with certain people, people that he's dining with, what the weather was like, uh, et cetera. So using all that to kind of uh, breathe life, uh, everyday life into Washington, and a little, a little bit of a different angle from some of the larger works on Washington himself. So we're gonna walk through the highlights uh, of, of the four books. So we, our opening image is Billy Lee in the summer kitchen at Mount Vernon. And he's telling a younger audience uh, that's living there. Um, sadly, all, all of the Washington slaves are eventually freed. Sadly though, at Mount Vernon, uh, slavery does come back, oddly enough. It's eradicated, and then, and then the Washington nephews bring slavery back to the property in the 19th century. But when Billy's there, uh, and again, Billy uh, living up to about 1810, all the Washington slaves had been freed as of January 1st of the year 1801. So he's still living in an environment uh, that is a slave-free. And of course, he's a free man, free to go, but Mount Vernon is his home. He's been there, as we mentioned earlier, from 1768. He's gonna live there and he's gonna die there. So this is where our Billy Lee story begins. Dr. Craig begins uh, in his uh, townhouse in Alexandria, where I can take you to the house today. There's a big plaque that has, uh, denotes the fact that Dr. Craig had lived, beautiful brick townhouse in Alexandria. My older son actually lives just a few blocks from there. Uh, but he begins his reminiscence of life with Washington. Uh, if, you, if you were to read this book, you would eventually find out that at, in the end, that the desk where he begins his story is actually the desk that George Washington used during his presidency. So in his will, he writes of Craig, to my oldest and intimate friend and compatriot in arms, I leave the desk and the writing chair that I used during my presidency. Ultimately, the writing chair would take on a little bit of a life of its own. Uh, a Craig granddaughter would inherit that desk and chair, and she was a, uh, a big uh, fan of Andrew Jackson, and she would take, just before Jackson retired, she would take the chair to the White House and give it to Jackson to take home. Where does Jackson go home to? Tennessee? The Hermitage? Yeah. So Washington's presidential chair would actually end up at the Hermitage and Jackson would then use in his retirement. When the Mount Vernon Ladies Association bought Mount Vernon and opened it as a, uh, as a, as a, a monument uh, to Washington, that chair would eventually be returned. But the two were used by Dr. Creek. So we've got him at, at, at Washington's desk and sitting in his chair as he tells his story of life with Washington. When the Marquis de Lafayette, after 14 months in, uh, in North America, and I think we have maybe 26 states at the time, when he's about ready to go back to France for the last time, he's, he's made four trips across the ocean in his lifetime to come to North America. When he's sailing down the Potomac to go out to a U.S. Navy vessel that will bring him home to France for the last time, now this is 1825, What's one of the last things that he sees before he the this, this steamboat makes its way out, out into the open waters uh, to get over the sailing vessel is Mount Vernon from the river. His, uh, his secretary, Lavasseur, who 
uh, keeps uh, a diary of the entire trip, uh, says that when, when the house came in view, Lafayette knelt down on the deck of the ship and lowered his head until the ship went by. He and his son, George Washington Lafayette, who lived with the Washingtons when he was 15 years old, was on this reunion trip and, and was with his father at the time. And uh, Nellie begins her reminiscence uh, at, a, at an 18th century writing desk, uh, as she's done so many times. And again, in that six, nearly 60 year period of writing letters uh, back and forth to her good friend, Elizabeth Bordley. So our doc, part of our documents collection, and the only document that we use in all four of our books is a survey that is handwritten and hand drawn by an 18 year old George Washington. So we see the date of 1750 and Washington's signature in the bottom. You'll see, as we show you some other documents throughout the presentation, how his handwriting has changed throughout the course of his life. This, this one has actually been displayed uh, in the museum at Mount Vernon. Um, but because Washington was exposed to the Western counties of Virginia as a surveyor, it would enable him to uh, move up the ladder, so to speak, as it relates to uh, military involvement uh, in the uh, French and Indian War, which leads to his election to the House of Burgesses in Virginia, which leads to the First and Se Second Continental Congress, which leads to him being selected as Commander in Chief of the Army, President of the Constitutional Convention. And it's often thought that when the, the Constitution was written, when the executive branch was written, it was written around one man who was sitting in the president's chair, and that would have been George Washington. So we're going to we're going to rest all this power in one individual. We just shook off the King of England. Can we trust one person with all of this power? If you're sitting looking at George Washington, that answer is going to be yes. So uh, eight, eight years in the Continental Army as general, eight years as president. It all began with his uh, couple of years as a surveyor, and again, his introduction to his western counties in Virginia, up into Pennsylvania, uh, and, and his involvement in, in two wars. Uh, so again, my feeling is that his surveying or his exposure to those counties is important enough that again, we use this document in all four of our uh, uh, in all four of our books. Washington, as a 16 year old, begins a survey. He would survey, and we'll, we'll show you in this presentation, one of the last letters that he writes before his death, he's having a discussion about surveying. And that's all the way up to November 30th of 1799. So, so he begins surveying in about 1748, and uh, at the end of his life, he's still doing it. So he's an enthusiastic surveyor. If you are to be granted a surveyor's license in Virginia, it's gonna come from this building. This is the Wren Building which is the original college building at the College of William and Mary. Uh, there's there's uh, no evidence that Washington actually went there to receive his license. The, the school has tried to make the claim that Washington is an alum on well, several occasions, and it kind of got shot down because it's a little bit of a stretch. Now, he would come to know this building quite well because he spends uh, 16 years as a Burgess in Williamsburg, and when he marries Martha, they actually live in Williamsburg for a few months before they move to Mount Vernon. Uh, it was her home uh, with her previous husband. And we're we, we're kind of we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, the inspiration that document uh, that was the inspiration for the second book, the Tiswell book. So this is uh, this this is this is all the way at the end of the story, but important enough we're showing the highlights. So. Mount Vernon, December 15th of 1799. Washington dies the night of the 14th. When this letter is written in the house, his body is still in the house. His body's held in the large dining room. If you tour Mount Vernon today, it's the first room that you go into. His body would be held there. So when the Mount Vernon community wakes up on the morning of the 15th, Martha goes to Tobias Lair, Washington's secretary, as we mentioned earlier, holding his hand the night before, it says, Larry, you need to let the world know that George Washington's deceased. He writes 12 of these letters that day. The first one leaves by courier and goes to John Adams, president of the U.S., still in Philadelphia. 
The second courier goes to Washington's good friend, Alexander Hamilton, and on down the line. Out of the 12 of these letters, only four are known to exist. We're fortunate to have one in our collection. And in it, it mentions Dr. Craig, right there. Now, the other doctors, a Dr. Dick and a Dr. Brown, are also mentioned. During the, the period where it's, uh, they've arrived at the conclusion that Washington's not going to survive, the other two physicians need to wait downstairs. They're not intimate enough with Washington. Craig, as his longtime friend, is invited to stay in the room for Washington passing away. And in fact, he's an eyewitness to Washington's final words. So those final two words, tis well. Washington looks at Lair, his secretary, and he's been given the Lair, sec Lair orders for the last 20 years. Lair is the first presidential secretary in American history. So to him, it's, it's uh, apparent that I'm not going to make it. When I die, don't put me in the tomb until I'm dead for three days. Lair, too emotional to answer, shakes his head in assent. Washington, with a, with a very, very bad throat, which is what takes his life, in as strong a voice as he can muster, he looks at Lair and he says, do you understand me? And Lair says to him, yes, sir, I do. Washington's response to that is, tis well. And they're the last two words that he would speak. He would actually remove his hand from Lair's, they were holding hands, and he would go to check his pulse. And as, he, and his, as his right hand went up to his left wrist, his right hand just collapsed into the bed, and they realized he was gone. Uh, Craig is standing there, and Craig pretty much makes the pronouncement that he's gone. So uh, the inspiration for a Lafayette book, this is, a, uh, this is a, the address leaf of a letter that Lafayette writes to George Washington in August of 1784, right? So in the 18th century, by and large, unless you have a large packet, you're not using an envelope. You're writing your letter, and then you're folding it up. You're folding this end in, that end in. Then you're folding top and bottom and creating this is the address leaf right here, right? Everything else is folded under. A little bit of Lafayette sealing wax, top and bottom, and what's referred to as a seal tear. So we'll give you a little manuscript presentation here, too. If somebody is trying to sell you an 18th century letter and it doesn't have a big whopping hole in it, don't buy it. It's a fake. It's got to have a hole, right? So the reason that I included this, I thought this was interesting. And the letter itself is the inspiration for the third book, My Dear General. Lafayette would re refer to Washington in this letter about six or eight times as My Dear General. But the interesting thing about this is you've got two kind of giants in world history and American history. You've got Lafayette writing His Excellency, as Washington was known during the Revolution, General Washington, Mount Vernon, Virginia. So you have Lafayette writing Washington's name. Washington receives the letter, rips it open, reads it. When he's done reading it, he dockets the letter in his handwriting from the Marquis de Lafayette, August 1784. That's the way he kept his records on when he received letters from people. So in one view shed, you've got two giants writing each other's names. You've got Lafayette writing Washington's name. You've got Washington writing Lafayette's name. Well, back to our art images. Uh, our kind of idea of what Billy and Frank Lee's arrival at Mount Vernon may have looked like. So particularly when I give presentations to younger readers, uh, we like to underscore the fact that in the 18th century, if you were a landed slave owner of Virginia, everything on this wagon, the crate, the barrel, the package, and the two young men are the property of George Washington, right? Uh, Washington and slavery is very difficult to reconcile with. It's part of his life. Washington becomes a slave owner at what age? Any guesses? 11, 11 years old. So those 10 people lined up against that wall, George, they're, they, they are there to do your laundry, comb your hair, feed your animals, work your fields, shine your boots, make your food. He would spend the rest of his life in that environment. 
We are also uh, underscore historic architecture, as you have seen so far with some of our images. And, a, and, and an idea of what Mount Vernon looked like when Billy and Frank arrived in 1768. The house is substantially smaller. When Washington moved there, first went there as a child, the house that is likely built by his grandfather, Lawrence Washington, was a story and a half. So the roof line would have been about right here. And the second floor rooms were more like garret rooms. Uh, but at the time of Washington's marriage, wife and two children, ready-made family, he gives instructions for the roof to be raised up a full story. Ultimately, the house that we would know today takes its final form about 1787 with the addition to the south, the addition to the north, begins around 1775, right at the outset of the American Revolution, when Washington and, and Rochambeau come to Mount Vernon in 1781 on their way to Yorktown. This large dining room that we would go in today is not completed yet. So the house uh, takes a back seat during the revolution itself. But again, Billy and his brother Frank arriving at Mount Vernon. The, uh, a, an extremely rare handwritten and signed by, again, not a household name, a man by the name of Christopher Gist. Yes, sir. The um, residence that you showed, was that the rear of the building? Good question. Good question. Excellent question. I love architecture, too. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, a, it's been a battle for years. Um, so when the house was built, the majority of the travel was by river, not over the road, right? So if you look at it, I'm unfortunate to own two 18th century homes. One of them, like Mount Vernon, um, the, this window at Mount Vernon still today is off center from the door. We exaggerated it not greatly, but you can see it's off just a tad, okay? Because the landing going up the steps makes the window off center. No one, particularly in the Anglo Palladian world of symmetry, I was just in Venice and taking in a whole bunch of buildings that Palladio built. 18th century symmetry is huge. Nobody is going to put an off-center window in the front of their house, right? So this was the back of the house at one time because of that off-center window. Nobody puts a staircase at the front of their house. When you enter that main door at Mount Vernon, it's shorter and it's a little off to the side, right? Nobody does that. You ride around and look at new developments today. E -e -e. <laughs> At any rate, uh, so excellent question. The front of the house is symmetrical. The back is not, right? Now the back becomes the front. So river travel becomes less used. We're now traveling via the roadways, and it changes. It swaps. And mainly, if go, go home. Look, I don't know whether we, yeah, we might have some other images about Vernier, but you'll see today. And ironically, um, my son and my wife were, were at Mount Vernon at closing time today. Beautiful sky, they were sending me pictures. And that, uh, that off center window always bothered Washington, but there wasn't too much you could do about it. I love that. I love that, that story. So Christopher Gist is a guy that Washington employs to take him west to visit the French commander that has come down to the, uh, what is today, Pittsburgh, Fort Duquesne, to tell him he is on British soil and he needs to go home. The French commander is very polite to Washington, shares his good French wine with him, an excellent dinner, but when dinner's over, he says, uh, Washington, you seem like a really nice kid, but when you go back to Williamsburg, tell your boss to tell his boss if he wants his land bad enough, he's going to come and fight for it. So that's really the beginning of the French and Indian War. But Gist is the person that gets in there and makes the claim that he saved Washington's life on two separate occasions. Once while a, a native guide 
uh, got out in front of them, pulled back the hammer on his musket and shot at Washington. Um, Gist pushes Washington out of the way. Uh, the second time, their canoe capsizes on a very cold night. Uh, Gist pulls Washington, Washington to an island in the middle of the river, and it had gotten so cold that night. Now imagine wool clothing soaked. It had gotten so cold that night when they got up in the morning, the river had frozen solid, and they were able to walk to the shore and not worry about uh, maneuvering without their canoe. So uh, it came up at an auction a couple of years ago, and it, it's an extremely rare signature, but I thought one that we needed to have in our collection. George Washington only leaves the continental, uh, uh, say, North America on, uh, on one occasion, and he goes with his half-brother Lawrence to the island of Barbados. So this is a, our, our, my artist's idea of what his arrival may have looked like. The, the trip is important for more than one reason, but the main reason his trip is important is while he's there, he's exposed to smallpox. And he's in bed sick for about three weeks. Well, we a lot of discussion about immunities over the past couple of years. Washington knows that if you survive, you have a natural immunity. When the American Revolution rolls around and the camps and hospitals of the Continental Army are ravaged with smallpox, Washington walks through both like a superhero, right? Now, did, did he ever divulge to anyone that he had smallpox and he survived it? Washington would maneuver and use theater here and there to make a point. So I suspect maybe he did not. Uh, but some contemporary descriptions of him physically uh, describe him as having some pock marks on his face from the disease itself. So Barbados, um, his half-brother Lawrence would go on from there to Bermuda. Washington would sail home alone uh, on his own from that trip. Um, 1746, somewhere in that area. The city tavern in the city of Philadelphia, anyone ever visited there, is a rebuilt building, but it's faithfully rebuilt. Uh, there were plenty of 18th century images of the building for the Park Service to put it back. It was a restaurant up to the time of the pandemic. Unfortunately, it closed, uh, but it's a magnificent building on the inside. Lafayette and Washington meet in this building for the first time. July 30th, 1777, Lafayette had been commissioned earlier in the day as a volunteer major general. Lafayette told Congress, I don't need your money. Before this is over, you're probably going to need mine. He's extremely wealthy. And actually, he does spend a lot of his money during the war. Washington's hastily built Fort Necessity uh, in western Pennsylvania, an absolute disaster for Washington. He reads, um, he reads a surrender document in that building. It's raining through the roof. The, the document still exists. There are water stains on it from the rain. In it, and it's written in French, in it, it says that you, George Washington, are a murderer, that you murdered the Sire de Jumonville. Washington's interpreter, a man by the name of Jacob von Braun, a Dutchman. So how smart is Washington? He has a Dutchman as his French interpreter. Von Braun misreads the document and says, it's good for you to sign, George. So Washington signs it and admits that he's in fact a murderer. Uh, so not, not, one of his, not one of the better periods in his life. Craig is there. Craig does battlefield surgery on Washington's men, British soldiers, French soldiers, and native soldiers who were fighting with the French. So you can only imagine all those worlds, the English world, the French world, and the native world all coming together in one place. Craig is from Scotland. He's a, a born and raised in Scotland, and he is uh, trained in battlefield surgery in Scotland and comes to Virginia and is assigned to Washington's unit. Oh, we missed one. Uh, Billy Lee is not only Washington's valet, but he's, he's, he's Washington's huntsman. When Washington fox hunts, Billy runs the hunt. Thomas Jefferson would refer to George Washington as the 
finest horseman of his age. In order to keep up with Washington, what does Billy Lee have to be? He's got to be the second finest horseman of his age. So little did the two men uh, realize that when they're hunting on Washington's, what would ultimately at the time of the end of his life be 8,500 acres of land at Mount Vernon. He owns 54,000 acres, about 8,500 in Mount Vernon. When the two men go storming onto the battlefields of the American Revolution, other officers would write home to their families. Uh, Washington, this great horseman, stormed onto the battlefield and his enslaved valet uh, kept up right with him in the battle. Billy would be an armed slave, a carbine, a pistol, and a sword that Washington would outf outfit him with to be able to fight during the revolution itself. This is the Sun Inn in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Anybody ever been to Bethlehem? Neat little Moravian settlement. When Lafayette is injured at the Battle of Brandywine, he takes a ball through his leg. He would eventually be brought here to this building, still there today, uh, which was a Continental Army hospital. He was only there for a short while when the people running the hospital realized his, uh, his status as an officer and his status socially as a very important Frenchman to the cause. They quickly got him out of there and brought him to a private residence. Lafayette would write an incredible letter from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to his wife back in Paris, uh, not only describing uh, how great the Moravian people were, they referred to them as Eastern Europeans that were taking such great care of him, but how he had uh, was taken by George Washington and the man's character, and he couldn't wait to get back to the battlefield. All from that uh, environment. Uh, the Isaac Potts House, uh, uh, Washington's uh, headquarters at uh, Valley Forge, is in this home that Dr. Craig, uh, who has the clout to barge in on Washington, goes through the front door, Washington's office right here, Pull the door shut. George, grab a seat. I got bad news for you. You're about to be overthrown by your own people. There's a move, a secret movement afoot to replace you as commander of the army. It's your, it's your own people and it's men in Congress. And I just want, I just found out about it. I want to let you know about it. Interestingly, word spreads around the camp of this cabal. And Lafayette is at his headquarters and hears of this. Lafayette storms over to the Isaac Potts house. When he gets there, he finds Washington's busy and he can't get in. What does he do? He goes back to his headquarters and he writes this incredible letter to Washington, uh, telling him how he has sworn to his fate and will defend it by, with the sword or by any other means available to me. Lafayette College in Easton actually owns that letter. And they allowed me to use an image of it in the Lafayette book. Um, the, the neat thing about manuscripts, and when I when I did when I researched the Lafayette book, I found that when the two men were apart from each other, there's a lot of information because they're constantly writing to each other. But when they're in camp together, there's nothing. They eat dinner together every night. Why write it down? They just saw the guy, right? In this case, we have that letter because he couldn't get in to see him. Had he gotten in. We would have no idea what, what his feelings were. If I'm in the uh, Revolutionary, if I serve in the Revolutionary War in the Continental Army, this is what my discharge looks like. All right. So as we said earlier, Washington's an aristocrat. We refer to him as His Excellency. There's Washington's signature there. Uh, June of 1783. You can see how that signature changed from the survey. All right. So all of these documents are pre-printed. And there's stacks of them where the, where, the, where the men are being cashiered out of the army. Washington thought it important to come up with a decoration that if you serve for all six years, so the Revolutionary War is eight years, we only fight for six. We sit idly for two years waiting for a peace treaty to be signed, right? At the end, for those soldiers that fought for all six years, Washington thought it'd be interesting that there would be some sort of decoration for them. So Washington comes up with what's referred to as the Badge of Merit, all right? And all of these documents are printed with that, but only if you serve for six years do you get it. So 
where they're signing these discharges, the floor is littered with this section of the document torn off. Hey, you only did four years, off it came, right? We're fortunate to have this one where our guy, Lewis Carey, uh, a matross, which is a low ranking artilleryman, uh, served in the third regiment of artillery. But we did a little research on him. He is uh, six years and he gets the badge of merit. So when you get your discharge, you, you want people to know that you received the badge of merit. Well, you're not going to walk around showing everybody your discharge. So what do you do? You go back to your tent and you take a piece of purple cloth and a pair of scissors and you cut out of that purple cloth a heart and you sew it to the lapel of your uniform. So when you walk around camp, if you've got a purple heart on your lapel, you are a recipient of the badge of merit. Ultimately, that decoration would morph over into another decoration. And if we look at the purple heart today, whose silhouette is on that heart? George Washington, right? So it all begins there with the badge of merit. I gave a talk one day, and frankly, I didn't know who I was speaking to. And in the group was a four-star general, retired, head of all forces uh, during in Africa during Benghazi. Uh, he, he tells the story that President Obama summoned him to the Oval Office and wanted to know what really happened. What he told him, he said Obama reached over, buzzed the secretary, and he said, prepare the general's retirement papers. And he had a swear in the Oval Office for a certain period of time that he would never tell the truth about what happened at Benghazi. He's able to tell a story now. But I feel like a goof because I'm talking about the badge of merit. I don't know who's in the audience. I look him up afterwards and he, he's a recipient of the badge of merit, which is still a decoration today. So in uh, the 1760s, Faneuil Hall in Boston burns to the ground about 1763. In 1765, a very prominent businessman in Boston decides he's going to run a lottery and raise money to rebuild Faneuil Hall. So if you visit Faneuil Hall today, this is the one that you're visiting, the one that was rebuilt after the fire. And that businessman is who? John Hancock. So in 1765, nobody knows who Hancock is unless you're from Massachusetts. We would soon know who he was as president of the uh, Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress. And the reason we included this in here is because when Washington is commissioned as commander in chief of the Continental Army in June of 1775, it's John Hancock who signs that commission. I think the original's in the National Archives. So it is in existence and it's got Hancock's signature. This is the, uh, the so we're, we're back to the Lafayette book. This is the Thomas Nelson House in Yorktown, Virginia. Nelson is a Continental Army officer. He's eventually a governor of Virginia. But during the siege uh, and the Nelson House is behind the British lines, Cornwallis used it for a short period, then he had to move out of there. During the siege, this gorgeous uh, Georgian brick building, still there today, it's got uh, artillery projectiles stuck in the bricks on this side. Um, Nelson goes to Lafayette. Lafayette is ordering a French battery to fire on uh, British strongholds. Nelson goes to Lafayette, Lafayette and he says, if, if my calculations are correct, the finest home in uh, Yorktown is that big brick building, and that's probably where Cornwallis has his headquarters. I trained my artillery fire on that building, which they did, and eventually Cornwallis moved out. Nelson never told anybody that that's the home that he grew up in and the home that he was still living in up to the British occupation. And it's a great place if you get the opportunity to visit it today. Uh, George Washington would uh, ultimately uh, select the Little Hill as a great place for the new government building, the Capitol, 
He would select that site. He would lay the cornerstone for that building. He would see a portion of that building uh, built before his death. He would also select the architect, the plans, and the location for what was then known as the President's Mansion. We call it the White House today. So we took a little artistic license here, and we know that Washington would take a carriage from Mount Vernon up to the federal district to inspect the construction of these buildings. I just decided to put Billy Lee in a carriage with him. Washington would get off a horse, reach into a saddlebag, pull out a wooden stake and a mallet, and he'd drive the stake in the ground right here. And he'd tell the commissioners, this is the northeast corner of the building. I want the building to be built in that direction. Never lived there. Uh, but did see the building almost to its completion. The, the cover image of our book, which is Lafayette arriving in 1784. So at Yorktown, after Cornwallis surrenders, Lafayette goes to Washington. He says, look, I've got a wife and small kids back in France. I need to get home. I've been over here for a couple of years. When you win, if you win, I will definitely come back and visit. In August of 84, he lands in New York, he sends Washington a letter immediately that he's here and he's on his way. It might take a little bit. He's a partier and he's a celebrity. And if somebody wants to throw a big dinner in my honor, well, I'm not going to tell them they can. The likelihood is based on Washington's records, uh, he never received that letter. But when Lafayette gets to Philadelphia, he writes a second letter. My dear general, I'm one step closer to holding you in my arms and how sweet it will be when we're reunited. That's the letter that we have in our collection. So this is the, the, the depiction of Lafayette's arrival back at Mount Vernon in 1784. It's the last the two men would see of each other. I've often made the claim that revolution brought the two men together uh, and revolution keeps the two men apart. The French Revolution makes it nearly impossible for Lafayette to come here. Um, political difficulties as well as imprisonment for a few years in Austria He's, he's free and he's planning to come here uh, when he finds out that Washington passes away. So they never do see each other after the 1784 visit. Washington is now retired from the presidency and he's doing what he does best. He's collecting rent on land that he owns in Berkeley, Frederick, and Fauquier counties in Virginia. And a nice signature of his. It's June of 1797. On March 4th, of 1797, he takes a second step into greatness when he stands at the House Chamber in Philadelphia and he witnesses John Adams be inaugurated as the second president of the United States. He served two terms. There's no term limits on the presidency at the time. He's essentially president for life if he would want to be, uh, but he doesn't want to be. He wants to go home. He wants to go back to being being a farmer again, and uh, and he does. Uh, enjoy a couple of years of retirement. And we can see here uh, in his handwriting, entirely in his handwriting, that Robert Lewis is his nephew who's doing some work for him. So fast forward, it's December 12th of 1799. Washington is in perfect health as he gets off of that horse. He gets up in the morning, he gets dressed, he eats breakfast, he rides all five of his farms. Dinner is served at Mount Vernon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he wants to be back there for dinner. It's about 2.45, maybe 10 minutes to 3, when he arrives back at the house. His secretary, Tobias Lair, meets him right in the front door. He says, General, um, you've got some uh, snow in your hair, and it rained, and your shirt collar's wet. Why don't you get changed before dinner? No, I don't want to keep my guests waiting. I'll be perfectly fine. He wakes up on the 13th with a sore throat, enough that he does not take his usual ride. He stays in the house pretty much all day long. He would, he would end up waking up on the, uh, in a, uh, a, uh, this is what a bill from Dr. Creek looks like. So we're, we're fortunate to have that in our collection. It's a four page bill of medical services rendered at Mount Vernon. Washington writing his will on July 9th of 1799. He's in perfect health. There's the desk and the chair that Dr. Craig would eventually uh, inherit. And uh, uh, working and trying to find a slide, I thought I had it. I guess I don't. Um, 
Washington would dismount the horse, um, spend the rest of the day, the, the 13th uh, in the house. On the 14th, he wakes up with a very bad sore throat. And, um, and he can no longer uh, get out, of, has a difficulty getting out of bed. He can just about talk, so on and so forth. And that begins uh, a day-long saga where he would pass that night, which we've discussed earlier. Uh, but somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock that night, uh, Washington would take his last breath uh, with, with, again, uh, Dr. Craig, Martha, and the like in the room. Uh, the, the castle that Lafayette would eventually spend the rest of his life in, in France. Uh, when, he's, when he's taken ill, uh, his son will move him to Paris because that's where he's buried with his wife. And his son wanted him to be close to, obviously, where, where he was ultimately going to be uh, interred. Our, uh, hmm. An engraving of what's referred to as Washington and family. Now, this is essentially Washington's second family. It's George and Martha, and it's Nellie who tells our fourth story, and her brother, George Washington Park Custis. Eventually, George Washington Park Customs would go upriver, up the Potomac, and as a piece of property that inherited from his father that overlooks Washington, D.C., he would build a home in honor of his step-grandfather, and he would name that home Arlington, right? He would eventually have a daughter, Mary, who marries a young, dashing federal officer by the name of Robert Edward Lee. Fast forward, Lee is summoned to Washington by Lincoln. If there's a civil war, I want you to be in charge of the Northern armies. Lee tells him, thanks, but no thanks. When the first federal soldiers are killed in Virginia in the American Civil War, what better place to bury them than in Bobby Lee's backyard, or front yard in this case. Uh, so a little bit of a, a tie in there too. Um, and again, uh, Nellie, a great version of Nellie, who tells that fourth story. The painting hangs at um, the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. That is a 1798 engraving. We were fortunate to uh, to uh, obtain a couple of years ago, and uh, it's the same year that Washington bought that, the engravings for Mount Vernon, of which one or two still hang there today. Matt? Do we know, is that Billy? Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that's likely never going to be answered. So, uh, I'm actually going back and forth with a gal at Winterthur right now who has a, a group of students that are studying this painting, and she positively identified him as Billy. I said, E, thin ice, you really can't do it. Um, the, the painting is, is important for uh, at least one reason. He's in the Washington family uniform, so we know exactly what it looked like and what the colors are. They're the Washington family colors, which is like a deep maroon and a cream color. If you look at a, uh, a Washington, D.C. license plate, the center of it is the, Washington, the center of the Washington family crest and Washington's colors. So when the study for this was done, it was done originally in New York when Washington spent his first year there as a president, about 1790. Billy was no longer serving as valet because he had fallen on two separate occasions and broken his legs. The Craig Bill that we showed you earlier, one of those line items is, is Craig Billy Washington for repairing Billy's broken leg. I wish I had it for the first book, but unfortunately timing was such that we didn't. Nevertheless, he's no longer serving as valet, but Billy is able to visit Washington in New York. He wanted to see him as president, right? He had left with him to, for the inauguration, but he became ill, and he had to be in Philadelphia for about two months. Two months was up. Washington paid for him to take a carriage to New York. Billy's pitch was, we kind of did this together, and, and it's fitting for me to be here while you're president. Washington, ever the ever-practical person, said, you know, you're just going to be in the way. Why don't you just go back to Mount Vernon? I'll see you when I get home. Billy would have none of it. I got to come and see you as president. So did Savage, Edward Savage, the artist, did he study Billy when Billy was there? Although Billy would not have been in the uniform, but Billy's a celebrity. Everybody knows who he is. Uh, maybe he included him in it. Was it Frank the Butler? We don't, unfortunately, it's Mary Thompson's 
said to me on more, more than one occasion, I still, I'm still waiting for a ladder of savages to turn up that tells us who that individual is. But we can't, can't positively identify them. It's nice to think that's who it was, but when Washington was raising these children, Billy was not serving in that capacity. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, uh, highlights of the of the uh, book that Nellie, uh, where Nellie tells the story, is because her father's dead. She is going. She asked Washington to give her away. She is going to marry one of Washington's nephews, and she'd like to get married at Mount Vernon, where she lives. She would also like to get married on George Washington's birthday. So this image depicts. The night Nellie is married, Washington writes in his diary that night, quite simply, Ms. Custis was married about candlelight. So candlelight is a, is a viable description of a certain time of the day. So if I said to you, uh, why don't you come over for dinner at my house tonight around candlelight, you're going to look at me and I have two heads. In the 18th century, it's when you lit candles, right? So... Our, one of my favorite art images, this is the large dining room. It's all lit. The cupola is lit. Um, it's about the time that Nellie's about to be wed. Mary Thompson had turned up in an, in an obscure document somewhere. She found, and I think I included it in the first book, the enslaved community that works in the house now. They're very close to the family because they're in close proximity all day long. They were invited they were told earlier in the day, you will be guests at Nellie's wedding and you will partake in the wedding feast with the family. Mary seems to think that maybe they dined separately in another room. Nevertheless, they were guests at, at her wedding and, and shared the wedding feast, which I think is pretty interesting at that point in their respective lives. But again, one of my favorite images, Washington uh, thinks enough of his Continental Army uniform that he, when he and Nellie descend that staircase, Nellie's in her wedding gown, Washington's got his uniform on. It's probably a remade uniform after the war, but it's still his blue and buff that he wears from during the war. Uh, imagine if you could just kind of snap your fingers and go back in history and be in that hair, the hallway and watch him descend that staircase. There's an Anglican pastor by the name of Tom Davis who, who celebrate, does the... Uh, Celebration there that night does the wedding itself. Unfortunately for all involved, uh, Tom Davis would be back at Mount Vernon uh, before the year's out to uh, celebrate uh, George Washington's funeral ceremony on December 18th, uh, the day that his coffin was carried down to the family tomb. So this is in our collection. Uh, it is uh, exactly two weeks before Washington dies when he writes his letter, he's in perfect health. He's writing it to his friend, Brian Fairfax, who lived at Belvoir. Bam, you, husband, your husband was there, right? This is the last letter that Washington wrote that's still known privately. Everything that he wrote, he wrote maybe two dozen letters after this are all in, uh, in collections. We're fortunate to have this one. Uh, and in it, as we mentioned earlier, he does talk about surveying. His friend, Lord Fairfax, who he's writing it to, is so ill that he could die any second. And Fairfax had written to him and said, you know, there's this property dispute. I think we really ought to survey it. And Washington, in the letter, writes to him, uh, come, come springtime, should your lordship's health permit, he's being polite. He basically said to him, if you're still alive, we'll go out and have a look. How ironic, two weeks later, when Washington's coffin is carried down to the family tomb, there's two men that are selected to walk right behind the coffin, Dr. Craig and Lord Fairfax, right? Uh, again, that, that great image. Uh, so there's our, the gentleman in the second row. There's our window, see it? See the space here and the space here? So who's gonna build the front of a house? with Palladian symmetry, Anglo-Palladian symmetry, and have that way off that far. So, but a great image. Washington wrote um, in his diary uh, about snow on the 12th and 13th. So we can, uh, we, can, we can have snow on the ground and the roof, 
one of the last things he wrote in his diary was, which I thought was kind of cryptic, the last thing he wrote was, large circle around the moon. So I said to my artist, I don't know if there's a moon on the night of the 14th, but I want one anyway, give me a moon. <laughs> so, so I'm doing a talk somewhere and there's a guy in the back and I can see him with his phone and he puts his hand out. December 14th, yep. Yeah. 1799, yep. Yeah. No moon. <laughs> so the internet's great, but you know, so at any rate. I said, artistic license. If I wanted a moon, I got a moon. There's the image I was looking for. So Washington is dying. His bed is over here. There's a fireplace over here. So I wanted my artist to get the the uh, the, the flickering embers reflecting off the faces of the three enslaved female servants that were in the room when Washington died. Molly, Caroline, and the third escapes me. It's in the caption. So somebody got a look at the book and said, ah, oh, you should have had an image of Washington like sprawled out in his bed. I said, now what is, what's more, what has more of an impact? Washington, if you asked Washington, he'd probably say, yeah, I did enough for humanity. I'm gonna make it through the pearly gates. When he dies, what happens to these folks? You think that was on their mind when he's about to take his last breath. Now, they're dower slaves. So not all the slaves at Mount Vernon are owned by Washington. The dower slaves were owned by the Custis family on loan to Martha to be dispersed amongst the Custis grandchildren at the time of her death, of which Nellie is one of those. So Washington writes in his will that he wants to free all of his slaves, but he doesn't want to do it until Martha's dead because he knew that the Custis slaves, the dower slaves and his slaves, a lot of them were intermarried and he didn't want to break families up. A lot of them got broken up anyway, but I thought this was this image would have a little more of an impact on Washington's death than, than an image of him uh, in, in, in the bed. The uh, last image in our Billy Lee book, um, the caption reads something to the effect of freedom for Billy comes at a high cost to him personally, and that's the death of his good friend, George Washington. So this is the old family tomb. It's still there at Mount Vernon. Washington's not in it. In his will, he left instructions, the location, and money to have a new will, uh, a new um, tomb built. About 1830, it was concluded, the construction was concluded, and uh, Nellie's brother, George Washington Park Custis, and her husband, Lawrence Lewis, were, were the uh, superintendents on that project, if you will, in about 1830. All of the Washingtons, including George and Martha, that were held in the old family tomb were moved over to the new tomb. So if you visit Mount Vernon today and you see Washington and Martha's sarcoph sarcophagi, singular, is that plural, two of them, sarcophagus, were, were moved there in the 1830s. That, however, is the structure still there, right? So we uh, highlight the door open with Washington's coffin on the inside, because we know that when Lafayette was there in 1824-25, the, the, the tomb was opened, Lafayette went in and laid on top of Washington's, draped himself over top of Washington's coffin. His secretary and his son, George Washington Lafayette, as I mentioned earlier, lived at Mount Vernon when he was 15 years old. He lived with the president of Philadelphia also. Stood outside, Lafayette came out of the tomb, tears streaming down his cheek, took his son by the hand and brought him into the tomb also. Uh, and, and Nellie, who had met Lafayette when she was younger and grew up with George Washington Lafayette as young, younger people, was also there for that, for, for their return as well, which is incredible when you think of those worlds coming together. So we're getting close to the finale. This is the 1832. So it's interesting because there's an art image out there of Lafayette on his 1824 and 25 tour, an art image and engraving of Lafayette standing at this tomb. The tomb wasn't there yet, but somebody took the two worlds and put them together, the tomb and Lafayette. Um, it's probably worth some money if you have one. 
This is the tune that Washington is in. Nellie, and this is the, from the book, uh, the story that Nellie tells, Nellie's dying wish was to be returned to Mount Vernon to be buried with her dear grandmama and her dear grandpapa. If you visit there today, in our images, the tomb when it's first built, right about here is an, is an obelisk, uh, and that's where Nellie's buried. So her, she, she was living in the Shenandoah Valley. She passes about 1852, and her final wish is granted, and she's returned to Mount Vernon, where she grew up as a child and spent her best days with George and Mar Martha Washington, her dear grandmama and dear grandpapa. And ladies and gentlemen, we're back to where we started. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. That, that's the abbreviated version. <laughs> but it, it is four books, though. So we we have, uh, hopefully, uh, the good folks you'll like here will invite me back. I do have PowerPoints for all four books individually, and we actually have a manuscript PowerPoint, which is kind of interesting to you, because you only saw a smattering of the manuscripts that are in the books. Any questions? Matt. I have another question, but can you give a shout out to your artists again? The, the mm. artwork is fantastic. Yeah, so uh, Preston Hindmarch, I grew up in New Jersey, right along the Delaware River. Preston lived in Easton, which is just before he passed, at home of Lafayette College, actually, which my oldest son's a graduate. So I went to him. Uh, he had done some, Preston's big one was like local, like the old theater and he would actually, all the way down to, there was a restaurant called Uncle Wesley's that were known for their cheeseburgers and their homemade french fries. And he actually did an art image of a table at Uncle Wesley's with a with a cheeseburger and french fries. You know, he, was, he was a pretty interesting guy. So um, I would tell him what I wanted and we'd work on it, two or three versions, and then boom, we'd end up with the, the final version. So Preston moved to Florida. We did the fourth book completely over the internet. Uh, but at the conclusion of the third book, and he knew that I wanted to do a fourth, and I knew that he was retiring and moving to Florida. And I think at the conclusion of the third book, with the four of us went out there, I said, oh, you dinner, we're going to go out. Four of us went out. We spent about three or four hours together, and I never mentioned a fourth book, not a word. My wife gets an email the next morning, Kim, um, if Jeff's strategy was to not mention a word about a fourth book, it worked. Tell him I'm ready to do it. <laughs> so, but very, very lucky to have had him. We, as I think I was talking to somebody here in the room, uh, two editors, uh, the same printer, and the same artist for all, all four of the books. So we were able to be able to pull that off. We've got books in the back there if anybody wants to have a look. And again, I'm happy to answer any thoughts or questions that you all might have. Thank you.